afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on justice, rural affairs and the environment. And in order to get as many que people in as possible and as many questions answered as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Question one, Animal Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Chief Constable Sir Stephen House and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill. I, I regularly meet the Chief Constable and other senior officers from Police Scotland to discuss matters of keeping people in Scotland safe. I last met with the Chief Constable on 22nd July and most recently met with Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingston on 13th August. Policing in Scotland is performing excellently. Crime is at a 39-year low. Violent crime is down by almost half since 2006-07. And homicides are at the lowest since records began. The risk of being a victim of crime is falling. And confidence in the police is high and rising. Thank you. Annabel Goldie. <clears throat> I thank the Cabinet Secretary. The recent um, armed police controversy has confirmed the lack of any meaningful accountability to the Scottish public by Police Scotland. When will Police Scotland introduce a national crime mapping initiative to increase transparency and to start tackling this issue of defective accountability to the general public? Well, I believe that the armed policing uh, situation will disclose the effect of accountability. We had Derek Penman at the Justice Committee yesterday. He's HMICS, and he, in his capacity, has indicated his uh, review into matters. The SPA have also indicated that they are investigating matters. These are the situation that's been set up by this Parliament to ensure that there, we did not have a situation with a single police service that there would be ministerial control or direction. There has to be operational independence. Equally, we have to ensure in a democracy, especially with a single service, that there is appropriate accountability. That accountability enshrined in statute is the Scottish Police Authority and the Inspectorate of Constabulary, along with a myriad of other organisations, including the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. Thank you very much. Question two, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on police stations having mental health nurses assigned to them, similar to the pilot exercise being carried out in England. Cabinet Secretary Responsibility Responsibility for health care and custody has transferred to the NHS. A lot of work has been undertaken across Scotland in relation to providing forensic nurses in police custody suites, culminating in regional networks being established by the NHS in April 2014. This work has proved extremely useful in providing quick and appropriate clinical care for a range of people in custody, including people with mental illness. Evidence from extensive research and from pilot work in NHS Tayside in partnership with Police Scotland, looking at improving how we respond to people who present in distress, shows that people seek a more compassionate response and are likely to achieve a more positive outcome when they receive such a response. Work to improve how services respond to people in distress is being taken up by the Suicide Prevention Strategy Implementation Group, whose membership includes representation from Police Scotland. Thank you. Jackson Carlock. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, encouraging response. I mean, the police have been thought to spend between 15 and 25 per cent of their time dealing with suspects with mental health problems, and many have been detained in police cells who would be better served by some sort of psychiatric intervention. I'm grateful for the comments he said, and clearly he does agree that early mental health intervention when a person first reaches the police may well re reduce reoffending. And, and save all manner of resources, in fact, by diverting them away from costly prison sentences. Will he give his personal support? I understand, obviously, that he said it's diverted to health, but is he personally backing that kind of development and initiative? I uh, yes, I do. I think the point made by Jackson Carlaw is an appropriate one. I think we all know that people present at police stations, uh, sometimes as victims, often uh, perhaps detained uh, as perpetrators. Uh, they may have underlying mental health issues. They may have clear mental health issues. Sometimes it's masked by drugs or alcohol. Sometimes that has exacerbated the situation, but clearly it's a drain on the resources there, but they do have a health problem that requires to be addressed. I think it was appropriate to ensure that we separated the NHS from the police dealing with this directly. The member's quite right that it is a significant drain upon resources, especially uh, when police officers are not necessarily trained and police stations are not appropriate from them. So I can give the member the complete assurance that that is the situation and can give him the also uh, the view that when uh, my colleague Alec Neil became the uh, Cabinet 
Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health. Uh, one of the first meetings we had was a meeting between him and myself, along with the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Constable of the new Police Service of Scotland. We are aware that both services require to take action here, and it's interests of both services, as well as fundamentally those individuals and the communities affected by them, that we work together. It cannot be solved solely by law enforcement. It has to be in partnership with health. Thank you. Question three, Jamie McGregor. Secretary, if you heard that. The Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill is a wide-ranging bill that covers a variety of issues in licensing regimes. It creates new licensing regimes in relation to air weapons and sexual entertainment venues. It amends the existing regimes in relation to alcohol, metal dealers, taxis and private hire cars and public entertainment venues, as well as making amendments across a range of licensing regimes under the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. All of this has been informed by consultation and ongoing engagement with the relevant stakeholders. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Um, I'm continuing to receive representations from many constituents in the Highlands and Islands who believe that the proposed new legislation on air guns is disproportionate and will prove costly and impractical. Given that 87% of those who responded to the government's consultation opposed the plan, that air guns are already regulated by law with more than 30 offences on the statute book, and that offences involving air guns have fallen by 75% in recent years, where is the government's hard evidence that this new legislation will actually have any effect on the tiny percentage of people who will always seek to misuse air guns in a criminal way? Uh, well, the member is correct that the misuse of air weapons has thankfully been uh, falling, but is actually for, uh, forming a greater proportion of firearms offences uh, than ever before. Uh, so, though we have a safer Scotland, we still have a legacy of tragedies, not least those who have seen their children slain by them, or indeed animals who have suffered by them. Over recent months, I have attended events with the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, who are deeply concerned about harm that is perpetrated perpetrated towards animals by the misuse of air weapons, I think the case has been proven uh, that there is a requirement for legislation to ensure the safety of our citizens, to ensure that those who have a legitimate use, and in particular those involved in pest control and those who Mr McGregor will know and represent in terms of the uh, farming and rural community, uh, we make sure that there are licences available. This is to protect not just the general public from the misuse of air weapons, but also to protect those who correctly, legitimately have such weapons uh, and should be able to do so through a regulated licensing regime. Thank you. John Penland. Cabinet Secretary, this bill also has a section on metal theft, which was tackled in England and Wales last year by the Scrap Metal Dealers Act. In my area, there has been a spate of brain covers and other metal thefts. Is this indicative of a general rise in such criminal activity? And are we witnessing a transfer of criminal activity to Scotland as a result of our more lax legislation? Well, I think memory is an interesting point. It was a matter of concern for many of the utility companies uh, when we were discussing this with them. Uh, thankfully, that has not been arising in the Police Scotland under the task force chaired by the British Transport Police, but operated effectively on the ground by Police Scotland. Action is being taken. There are obviously those who seek, as part of serious organised crime groups, uh, to make money by harming communities, by being involved in robbing from utilities with great danger uh, to communities. And that is why this action is being taken appropriately by Parliament. The bill is now in and will be going to committee later this year. Uh, and indeed, as I say, uh, thankfully, uh, because of the vigilance of Police Scotland, uh, we are not seeing any, uh, if I can put it, tourism traffic in terms of criminality. Uh, but the police are ever vigilant to that and remain in discussion with all the stakeholders, in particular utility companies. Thank you very much. Question four in the name of David Torrance has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation provided. Question five, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports community organisations in the Glasgow region in using funding from the Cash Back for Communities programme and other money seized under proceeds of crime legislation. Cabinet Secretary. 
I had the great pleasure of announcing in Denison yesterday a further 1.5 million uh, funding for Scottish Sports Futures as part of the further expansion of cashback communities over the next three years. We're continuing to crimp hemorrhoids hard in their pocket through the use of proceeds of crime legislation, which has resulted in more than 90 million being recovered in the last 10 years. Since I announced cashback in 2007, more than 74 million of nefarious cash has been stripped back from criminals and has been ploughed back into communities across Scotland. Glasgow's young people and their communities have directly benefited so far from over 5.3 million of that cashback investment through a wide range of sporting, cultural, youth work and community projects which has seen over 160,000 opportunities and activities that would not simply have existed uh, without cashback. Thank you. Bob Doris. Um, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. I welcome the recent funding of £1.5 million to Scottish sports futures from cashback from communities, as, as outlined by, by the Cabinet Secretary. It was distributed by local partners such as Activist in my region. I would like to commend to you the work of the Gladiator Weightlifting Programme for young people in Easter House, who so far have not accessed such funds locally, but who I am hopeful can benefit uh, going forward, given that they offer both diversionary activities and sporting pathways to success for young people in a deprived community. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to perhaps in the months ahead visit this excellent project with me to see for himself the excellent work that they do? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would be happy to try and do that. I don't know the particular organisation, but obviously I appreciate Mr Doris's uh, testimonial for it, and I'm happy to try and do that, subject to diary commitments. I was delighted, as I say, to travel to Denison yesterday to see the good work that will be ongoing. I'm aware of the outstanding work that's already ongoing with Clyde College and Scottish Power through street soccer, the Action for Children, indeed a recent investment in the Celtic Foundation. Uh, so Glasgow is benefiting not simply from cash by support, but from the cashback support for community-owned organisations that do a remarkable job, and I would be delighted to meet with that organisation, as well as, I say, having met with many of these other organisations, and in particular, as I say, with Scottish Sports Futures, who I was delighted to meet at Denison yesterday. Thank you. Graham Pearson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Given that the recent assessment uh, costed organised crime a billion pounds a year in Scotland, and that this year's assessment of recovered assets stands about £8 million. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any programme in place to up the assets recovered so that cashback can benefit accordingly? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, we do. That's why, early in the juncture, this administration established a serious organised crime task force uh, to ensure not only that we uh, seek to minimise uh, and address and tackle serious organised crime, but that we take their assets uh, from them. Uh, so it's part of the ongoing strands, the four Ds that we have, uh, and that is one aspect of it. We always seek to improve, sometimes by changing the legislation here, sometimes because it's reserved uh, aspects, changing it south of the border. But it's certainly the desire of this government, ably supported by the Solicitor General, uh, who leads with, obviously with the Civil Recovery Unit, to ensure that we maximise the harm to those organised organisations who would cause damage in our communities. Thank you. Question six, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consultation it has had with the UK Government regarding the implementation of legislation relating to data laws. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I made clear in the statement I made to Parliament on Tuesday, 5th August, the Scottish Government was not consulted on the matter of the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Bill. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answers. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, if he had full powers over this issue, how would he have dealt with it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think there has to be greater discussion. That's why we are quite clear it's a matter for this chamber. It's not a matter for me as an individual or for us as a government. There are different views within this chamber. I think when I made the statement on the 5th of August, Patrick Harvey from the Green Party was quite clear about where he saw uh, the uh, balance being struck, because it is a matter of balance between protecting the rights of the individual citizens from intrusion, but also protecting the wider community from harm that individuals may be served. As an administration, we've always been quite clear that the powers are necessary, but we do have to ensure proper scrutiny. We do have to ensure the protection of the rights of the individual, as well as balancing it for the community. But I can give the member the uh, complete assurance it will be for the Parliament to decide as a whole. It will have proper investigation and review. There will be discussion with appropriate stakeholders, not simply police, but those who represent the rights of citizens. 
And equally, when we bring in such powers, one of the major concerns that existed south of the border in Westminster is how do we also ensure democratic scrutiny and oversight in the years to come? The legislation is one thing. The ongoing supervision of some things that will, by very nature, be covert and secret have to be, as I say, satisfactory to those who represent the democracy. Thank you very much. Dr Elaine Murray. Just, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, could the, the Cabinet Secretary clarify that while we know he is dissatisfied with the process of the legislation, whether or not he's actually content with the content of the legislation? Cabinet um, Secretary. Well, no. I mean, I think the whole debate south of the border was that we were being rushed into it. And I don't have the precise quotes in front of me, but they straddled the chamber down in Westminster uh, from David Davis on one side across to uh, Tom Watson, I think it was, and Diane Abbott, both expressing concerns about the situation that they faced, not simply the timescale, but what they were being asked to sign up for. What I can reiterate to Elaine Murray is that as an administration, we recognise that actions like this do require to be taken by governments on behalf of protection, not simply of our citizens, but citizens elsewhere in other jurisdictions who were obliged to protect. It is a matter of balance of where you set that calibration, and there may be disputes about where that calibration should be, as there are, no doubt, south of the border. There may very well be in future years in this chamber. But we remain convinced, and I think even Patrick Harvey is convinced, that some aspects will require to take place. What is required to do is to ensure that we have the appropriate legislation with the appropriate checks and balances, and it's that that is causing the concern, not simply in this Parliament, but south of the border. Many thanks. Question 7, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the need for innovative thinking when planning new justice-related buildings. Deputy Secretary. The responsibility for justice-related buildings lies with the relevant bodies, but it's clear that we should work together to find ways to continue to provide high-quality facilities for the people of Scotland, which represent good value for money. The Sheriff Court in Livingston has shown the way in which justice and related services can work together to provide an integrated service. And while the question is about buildings, access to justice is not just about buildings, but how we can take advantage of digital technology to provide our services. And the Scottish Government has been working with justice organisations to develop plans and indeed published the Justice Digital Strategy at an event I attended today outlining our work in this area. Thank you. Dave Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Given that Eric McQueen, Chief Exec of the Scottish Court Service, Inverness Sheriff Principal Derek Pyle, former Chief Inspector of Prisons Brigadier Hugh Monroe, Highland Council and Police Scotland all believe that a Highland Justice Centre is the way forward for the North, can the, the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on a Highland Justice Centre and particularly its linking with a new prison? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member may know, the Scottish Court Service set out its long-term vision for the Court Service in Scotland, which included the development of justice centres and key strategic population centres, including the Borders, Fife, Lanarkshire and the Highlands. The Chief Executive of SCS has stated that they would be undertaking feasibility studies in these locations, which would involve justice partners and relevant local bodies. The first of these was undertaken in the Borders and reported earlier this year. The member may also be aware that a working group was announced last week to look at alternative tourism opportunities for Inverness Castle, which is currently home to the Sheriff Court. This is, I believe, a welcome move, and the SCS are examining how future business accommodation needs in Inverness could be met and funded to allow consideration for the court to move to an alternative location. This will require detailed analysis and discussion with other justice organisations, Scottish Government and Highland Council. Thank you. Question eight. Nanette Mill. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how much the Scottish Court Service will save as a result of the closure of Sheriff and Justice of the Peace Courts. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Court Service estimated the following savings from the court closure programme. The annual savings in terms of running costs will amount to around £1 million. And there will also be one-off savings of backlog maintenance, which will now not have to be paid out of the public purse of around £3 million. Annette Milne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. We have already seen our justice system impacted by delays in cases being heard and the many concerns expressed by campaigners about the unseen costs of the proposals to close 11 sheriff courts now coming true, not to mention the lack of privacy in the Aberdeen court, for example, for accused people and their lawyers, which is currently causing problems. 
Um, does the Cabinet Secretary feel any regret for the way in which the Scottish Government have handled the closures? And, and will he task Audit Scotland to look at the closures to investigate if Scottish taxpayers have indeed seen the predicted uh, level of savings? Uh, uh, no, I won't. I believe the best people to uh, account for this are the Scottish Court Service. I was delighted, therefore, just a few weeks back to go to Aberdeen Sheriff Court to see the newly opened uh, civil court buildings that I think are outstanding. And I pay great tribute to Sheriff, Derek Pyle, uh, Sheriff Principal Derek Pyle for the outstanding work and leadership that he has shown there. Uh, there have been challenges to the court system because of an increase in uh, some uh, types of proceedings. Uh, these have to be dealt with by the court. They are being given additional financial assistance. That is something I very much welcome, but I do believe that the Lord President has looked at matters, has indicated that we require to get the justice system into Scotland, into the 21st century, into a better uh, landscape, and, that, and he has my full support in that. Many thanks. And we now move to questions on rural affairs and the environment. And call on question one, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the level of Pillar 2 funding for rural development that an independent Scotland could expect to receive from the EU. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. As a result of the recent agricultural allocations under CAP, Scotland will find itself at the bottom of the league tables for both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 funding. However, of course, with a seat at the top table in Europe, an independent Scotland would have the opportunity to negotiate itself a much better deal in the next common agricultural policy post-2020. Indeed, has Scotland been independent in the recent negotiations and been able to negotiate a per hectare deal similar to Ireland's, it could have secured an extra €2.5 billion Euros in rural development funding alone. That is funding which has been used to support vital capital grants, for instance, for farms and crofters, support for new entrants, agri-environment schemes, climate change projects or community initiatives in rural areas. Colin I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is nothing short of scandalous that in the recent CAP negotiations, 16 member states negotiated additional uplifts for rural development, while the UK Government chose not to negotiate any uplift, resulting in Scotland having the lowest funding for rural development in Europe, with Scotland languishing at €12 Euros per hectare, while the European average is €76? Euros, is it not time we took our seat at the top table in Europe as a matter of urgency? Cabinet Secretary. Colin Beattie perfectly illustrates why you should not ask other people who do not share your interests or your priorities to negotiate on your behalf in international negotiations. It is a fact that Scotland went into this recent negotiation with the lowest level of rural development funding in Europe. 16 other countries already above Scotland in the league table negotiated an even better deal. And the UK Government, despite Scotland's request, refused to lift a finger to improve Scotland's position in the league table. So despite being a, a largely rural country with huge opportunities in rural communities, we could get the right investment in place. We suffered because UK ministers refused to stand up for Scotland or listen to concerns from this country. So that is indeed why we need a yes vote in four weeks' time so we can speak for ourselves in Europe. Thank you. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary might accept two things. Firstly, that it looks somewhat strange for him to call for any increase in any aspect of EU funding when his party's representatives at Westminster uh, wanted an even greater reduction in the overall EU budget than was eventually achieved. And secondly, would he accept that whatever our constitutional situation, there will be no opportunity to renegotiate the CAP budget before 2020, and that any assertions that we would be better or worse off under different circumstances are nothing but idle speculation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, unsurprisingly, I profoundly disagree with both points made by Alec Ferguson. Indeed, his first point he misleads uh, on the facts, given that the SNP MPs in Westminster did not argue for a reduction in the CAP budget, which comprises 38% of the overall European budget. And indeed, the SNP made suggestions where some modest savings could be made in the overall EU budget and argued against David Cameron's proposals to increase the overall EU budget. The second fundamental point here is our share of the CAP budget. The size of the CAP budget is one debate. Scotland's share of the CAP budget is what really matters here. We get the lowest level share of that budget in the UK and the whole of Europe. There is a funding formula that was adopted that applies to member states, all member states, big and small. We did not have that apply to Scotland because we are not a member state. Had it applied to Scotland, we would have qualified automatically under a formula for an extra billion euros between 2015 
and 2020. And in terms of Alec Ferguson's second point, in terms of the next common agricultural policy, this government is not arguing that we can reopen the cap budget for this spending period up to 2020. What the Yes campaign are arguing is that had we been independent for the recent negotiation, we'd be a billion euros better off under Pillar 1. And we're also arguing that the people of Scotland have a choice for the next cap negotiation, which will start within a year or two of Scotland becoming independent in 2016. Who shall be in the driving seat to represent Scotland, an uncaring, disinterested UK minister from Whitehall, or Scotland's farming minister who will strike a much better deal for Scotland's farmers and crofters? Thank you. Question two, Stuart Macmillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact marine protected areas will have on recreational boating and marine tourism. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the 30 new marine protected areas we recently designated should serve to help protect the rich waters of Scotland that so many sailors and other marine tourists enjoy. Recreational boating and marine tourism requires a healthy marine environment, and for this reason, the Scottish branch of the Royal Yachting Association have thrown their support behind the MPAs that will protect the ecosystems and waters that people come from all over the world to enjoy. I would therefore express a view that MPAs will potentially boost marine tourism and the economic value that derives from the sector. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for the reply, and the Minister will be aware of the economic benefits uh, that the recreational boating and marine tourism sectors actually bring to Scotland. And as a former member of the CPG, is very much aware of the issues that have been raised uh, in the cross party group. But, uh, but uh, I would like to ask the Minister whether the Scottish Government will actually undertake research to monitor the social economic benefits of marine protected areas and how actually this will impact upon the marine tourism sector. Minister. Well, I certainly uh, recognise the, the interest that there has been at this. The, the recent evidence session on MPAs taken at uh, last week's RACI committee, one of the stakeholders I know did suggest that uh, the statutory review of the MPA network every six years should also include uh, a revised impact assessment, the costs and benefits of the network. I am attracted to that proposal uh, and intend to look into the feasibility of that and what scope there is uh, to, uh, to, to, to include assessment of the economic effects and benefits of marine protected areas on marine tourism, given uh, the strong interest in that issue. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as the Minister knows, so-called blue carbon is captured and stored across a range of seabed types, such as seagrass. The new SNH report, Assessment of Carbon Budgets and Potential Blue Carbon Stores in Scotland's Coast and Marine Environment, states that acid, ocean acidification could affect the marine environment adversely. In view of this, can the Minister provide details of how these carbon storing habitats could receive protection within the marine protected area network, if not today, then um, as the report only came out today, um, in, in the near future, and whether these features could be allocated before the review date of 2018? Minister. Well, it's, it's certainly true. I know Claudia Beamish has expressed a strong interest in this issue through the process of the RPP2 as well, uh, looking at blue carbon. It's something we are committed to looking at in the next uh, RPP3, uh, and it's a developing area of policy work, a bit like Peatlands was in, in respect of the previous report and proposals and policy. So I do give the member an assurance and members in the chamber that we are taking a, a considerable interest in this, and I will reflect on the report and look in what areas we can work on uh, those kind of habitats and see what contribution they can make to our climate change targets. Thank you very much. Uh, question three, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the British Veterinary Association. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Scottish Government officials are in at least weekly contact with the British Veterinary Association on a wide range of issues across the animal health and welfare, welfare portfolio. The Chief Veterinary Officer for Scotland met formally with the BVA on the 15th of May and discussed a range of issues including veterinary surveillance, non stun slaughter, regulation of veterinary professions, dog tail docking and compulsory microchipping of dogs. And she'll meet again formally with them on the 9th of September. Thank you much. Alex Johnson. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he's, he or his officials have had specific talks regarding concerns about ritual slaughter and whether, as a result, he has any intention of bringing forward proposals to include on labelling on Scottish meat uh, wh whether stunning took place prior to slaughter? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> This is an issue we have uh, been looking at uh, in recent uh, weeks and months. Uh, the religious slaughter of animals for food is, of course, a difficult, sensitive and complex issue. We have to be very careful in terms of any debate around labelling and take on board the, the view of Scotland's faith communities. 
It is widely accepted that animals should be stunned before slaughter to properly safeguard their welfare, but we do have to recognise the importance that Jewish and Muslim communities in particular attach to being supplied with meat from animals slaughtered in accordance with their religious beliefs. I understand the European Union are contemplating looking at this issue, and I will ensure that Scotland has a voice in these discussions. Thank you very much. Question four, Aileen MacLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how independence would support rural development funding in rural communities such as in Dumfries and Galloway. Well, as I just explained in response to Colin Beattie, independence right. will give a positive boost to communities across Scotland in many, many ways, and our rural communities in particular would stand to gain from potentially significant increased budgets brought by having our own voice in Europe and negotiating for Scottish priorities. Liam McLeod. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that just as Scotland received the lowest level of rural development funding in the EU, the Dumfries and Galloway has a disproportionately high reliance on agriculture and related rural-based industry for employment and also the lowest full-time wages in Scotland. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline what opportunities would an independent Scottish Government have to address this situation? Cabinet Secretary. Ellie McLeod quite rightly raises the fact that Dumfries and Galloway, like the rest of Scotland, lost out significantly from the fact that Scotland did not have her own voice in the recent negotiations over the common agricultural policy and the budgets that flow through Pillar 1, which is direct farm payments, and that those that flow through Pillar 2 of the policy, which is rural development funds. And Dumfries and Galloway, not just the primary producers in terms of the farmers, but also the rural businesses, the village hall committees, renewable energy projects, agri-environment projects, and so the list goes on, all lost out because we do not have our fair share of EU rural budgets. Mm. That's something Scotland can put right in four weeks' time, and we can get a fair share. And the only way we'll get a fair share of these budgets is having someone going to these negotiations who represents Scotland's priorities, Scotland's interests, and does not negotiate against them. Question five, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what benefit farmers and crofters would have through Pillar 1 funding in an independent Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. I can detect an emerging theme in question time today, but can I just say that an independent Scotland with a seat at the top table in Europe will have the opportunity to influence the next cap negotiations and lift ourselves off the bottom of the league tables, as I've said before, for both pillars of the common agricultural policy budgets. Had Scotland been independent during the recent negotiations, we would have benefited from the EU minimum rate of €196 Euros per hectare, which, as I've said before, would have meant about an extra €1 billion Euros of support over the next cap period up to 2020. Thank you. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree with me, then, that those are the reasons why no less than four former NFUS presidents are publicly supporting the Yes campaign? Cabinet Secretary. Can I just say that, uh, can I just say that it is very significant that four former NFU presidents declared for yes last week. Four yeah. former NFU presidents who are still, still active Order. in farming affairs in this country mm. and still have their fingers on the pulse of the mood of farmers and crofting yeah, yeah. and the impact of public policy in these vital industries. The fact that a formula was agreed by Europe which would have delivered an uplift to Scotland had we been a member state, is surely something very pertinent to the future of our rural communities and farmers and crofters and food production in this country. And to rub salt into the wound, even though we lost out on our share of the budget, the UK were given £190 million yeah. because of Scotland's yeah. low payments to get the whole of the UK rate above the threshold to qualify for those funds. The UK Government then took the decision, despite the fact that Scotland is the lowest level of funds in the whole of Europe already, and it was only because of Scotland the UK got that cash, to deny Scotland the £190 million. That is scandalous, and that is why the four NFU presidents will be followed by thousands of farmers yeah, yeah. in four weeks' time voting yes in the referendum. Yeah, yeah. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I simply have to ask the Cabinet Secretary on the back of that reply that if four former NFUS presidents is a resounding endorsement for yes, are not 16 former NFU presidents, vice presidents, and the chair of Quality uh, Meet Scotland a four times more important resounding uh, backing for the No campaign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Can I just say that uh, I respect the views of all farming leaders and former farming leaders uh, in this debate, irrespective of which generation they represent and when they were vice president or president. It's very serious, the, the decisions and the 
the views that people have to adopt and take in relation to Scotland's future. But if someone has said that four former NFU presidents several years ago were going to declare for yes in a Scottish independence referendum, I think I'd have been pleasantly surprised at that point in time. But here we are, and it actually is the case. But more importantly, when I travel the agricultural shows, as I have been throughout this whole summer, I have met literally hundreds, if not thousands, of farmers who have told me they are voting yes yeah, yeah. in four weeks' time. And it's one vote per farmer, and that's what matters for Scotland's future. Thank you. Question six, Gordon MacDonald. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce red tape for agricultural industries. The Secretary. In 2012, I commissioned Brian Pack to undertake an independent report into how best reduce red tape for farmers and land managers. Following extensive consultation with the industry and stakeholders, the report was presented to me at the Tariff Show a few weeks ago. The report contains 61 recommendations aimed at reducing red tape, and I immediately accepted one of the main recommendations to establish an overarching advisory board to help improve the strategic and operational alignment of all our delivery bodies in Scotland. And I'll make announcements in due course about the other recommendations. Okay. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I'm pleased that he's considering setting up an advisory board to help cut farming red tape. It will free up more time for farmers to farm by reducing on-farm inspections and bureaucracy is, I'm sure, welcome news. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an indication of when the advisory board will be up and running? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have already started to look at how that advisory board uh, should be comprised, and I hope to make announcements uh, in the coming weeks. It's worth saying why it's important, this recommendation. It's because we have many agencies and bodies who operate in rural Scotland and who farmers and crofters and land managers have to deal with. Therefore, I think it makes perfect sense. The more aligned they are, the better. The same systems, uh, perhaps one point of contact, whatever these steps may be in the future, uh, that could only be of benefit in terms of reducing bureaucracy and red tape and time for our hard-working primary producers in rural Scotland. Thank you. Question 7, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government whether an independent Scotland would see an increase in funding from the EU European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, and if so, by how much? It's a very good question from Angus MacDonald, and I detect the opposition MSPs don't like it. No. So I shall. I think, however, it's very, very important to relay the truth to all parties uh, in this chamber. Uh, Scotland will receive the third lowest level of funding in the whole of Europe as part of the new European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, recently negotiated by member states. We received just 1.9% of the EMFF budget, despite a fleet landing 8%. I repeat that, 8% of fish got, caught in Scottish waters, in EU waters. Uh, once again, the UK Government, of course, let Scotland down by not fighting for a fairer share of these important budgets. As a member state in our own right, we would be able to negotiate a far better deal to help our fishermen, processors and agriculture sector. Fishing is many, many times more important to Scotland than it is to the UK as a whole, and that's why, with independence, it will be treated with respect and is a much greater priority than it ever will be by a distant and disinterested UK Government. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. It is clear that Scotland's fishing industry has been just as poorly served by successive UK governments as our agricultural industry has. Uh, fish landings, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, uh, in Scotland account for 8 per cent of the EU's total landings and 12 per cent Question. of EU aquaculture production, but we receive only 1.4 per cent of the EFF allocation. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that is fair? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, just to put this uh, debate into context, or this issue into context, Scotland represents the fourth largest sea area in the whole of Europe. Just think about that for a second, the fourth largest sea area in the whole of Europe. Another fascinating statistic, 20% of the fish taken from European waters is taken from Scottish waters, 20%. The fishing industry is many times more important, as I said before, to the UK than it is to Scotland as a whole. Despite that, we receive 1.9%, 1.9% <coughs> of the European Fisheries Fund. And for those who say independence won't make things better, all I say in return to that is independence simply couldn't make anything more worse, because we are in the worst position possible when it comes to these funding shareouts. We can only do better having our own voice in these negotiations to get a fair share of these vital funds for Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. It's interesting that the Cabinet Secretary has told the Royal Committee 
that the UK and Scottish Government work very well together on yeah, fisheries yeah. matters. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, can the Minister enlighten this Parliament about the implications on Scottish fishermen that would arise if the fisheries fund support were to be lost, especially as the majority of experts on the EU, as well as EU officials, have concluded that an independent Scotland would not automatically be admitted to the EU? Permanent Secretary. Order. Uh. <coughs> Next, the, uh, the member will be accusing independence of not delivering some kind of television se service for Scotland. <laughs> uh, they get more and more preposterous by the, by the day. Uh, there are some issues I welcome when I work with the UK Government in fisheries negotiations. However, where we do succeed in European negotiations in terms of getting support from the UK is where Scotland's interests coincide with the rest of the UK. The difficulty is where Scotland's interests don't coincide with the rest of the UK. That's where we need our own voice in these negotiations. At the moment, when we get the concessions from the UK Government, they happen to be in issues where they coincide with the interests of the rest of the UK. In other words, they're going to be negotiated for in any case. And therefore, an independent Scottish voice can add weight to where we agree, but where we disagree and have different priorities, we'll have our own voice and own ability to secure a good deal for Scotland's fishermen. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions for this afternoon. Point of order, Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And on a point of order, you'll know that the agenda this afternoon